This is an SBC Media Partners production. Swung on, hit high and deep. Right Phillies fans, these are your glove stories with Murph. Check out with Greg Murphy. Murphy, you got a special guest, huh? Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Glove Stories with Murph. Great to have you here with us. Brought to you by the great folks at Bet Parks Casino Sportsbook app, the Shy Vintage Sports, and Phillies Nation. Thank them for their support, and we are really excited about our guest today. Uh, many of you know his best friend, much maybe much better than you know the man himself, but uh, we are welcoming in Tom Burgoyne, the best friend of the Philly fanatic, and uh, and you've been close to the big green guy, Tom, for almost, what, yeah, five it's years been, at this point, I think? <laughs> five, it's been a little bit more than five years, Murph. About 35, you know, it's, 35. Yeah, 35. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy how time flies, Murph. We're having a ball. It's great. Yeah, you get a chance to hang out uh, every single day and uh, I, I know that relationship to of you is uh, is very close but let's go back to, uh, to the early days of Tom Burgoyne uh, um, St. Joe's prep high school student probably causing all kinds of havoc in school were you, were you a rebel rouser in, in high school ah, rebel rouser how about that that's I haven't heard that term in a while Murph I usually throw out just class clown you know okay. class clown right. but uh yeah little you know I used to have fun I was uh, the energetic kid I Murph I was also the kid just lived and died Philly sports you know I just uh couldn't get enough of it so that was my combination you know it's uh, a little bit of class clown and just a diehard Philly sports fan yeah, and then off to Drexel, uh, so staying here in Philadelphia. You know, Philly, this city, uh, for those of us that grew up here uh, and, and stayed here and been lucky enough to, to have our careers here, uh, it gets in your blood. It, it becomes part of what you are. And it, on the flip side, you and your best friend have become part of the fabric of Philadelphia as well. That's got to be pretty special, right? Yeah, uh, it's Mind blowing, Murph. I mean, if, if you would have told me, uh, you know, when I was a 10 year old kid that, you know, I'd be best friends with the Fanatic uh, all this time, it would just be uh, just it's just a dream come true, really, you know, so, uh, you know, it's so cool when we have, you know, alumni days or guys passing through. It's like, man, we've gotten to know all these guys, all our heroes, the guys who we watched, uh, you know, growing up as kids. So, uh, you know, it's just been so much fun. I can't I can't even describe it. Yeah. And, you know, I'm no different. I remember <clears throat> back in the day. Now, you met the Fanatic in 1989. And at that point, uh, he was hanging out with that guy, Dave Raymond. They were right. they were best of buds, but uh, they were the best friends. But, but then in 1993, uh, Dave had to, to go on his way. They're still tight. The Philly Fanatic and Dave are still tight. But you, uh, you became uh, the closest friend of the Fanatic at that point. But even for me, thinking back, you know, growing up and going to the vet in 1980 and 81 and 82 um, and thinking, I, I, I remember, you know, the fanatic doing his thing. The, the one uh, the, the one bit I always remembered as a kid, like a, I was probably 13 or 14 years old. And, and this one resonates with kids like that. There was a pregnant woman sitting in the seat and, and the fanatic went over and sat down and pushed his belly up. But I, I must have laughed for about a week after that because yeah. and, and those kinds of, of uh, gags and, and, and pranks, he still pulls, right? Still pulls, you know, I think uh, that character, you know, Dave Raymond was, you know, the first guy and, you know, he really um, broke the mold, you know, and, and really, uh, you know, started things off, you know, people really hadn't seen a character like that before, I guess the San Diego chicken, you know, was the first of its yeah. kind. Uh, yeah, that's right. The chicken. Yeah. Ah. But, uh, you know, so, so I guess that had been out there, but Dave was just so good at mime and slapstick and humor. Uh, our sensibilities are very much the same. I still keep in touch with Dave. Uh, but some, so I guess when I took over, you know, I was his backup for five years. Uh, you know, I think it was important to keep the character the same and some of those those bits, you know, I mean, when the fanatic sees a bald head, he, he's not going to walk past that, you know, <laughs> you know, that's just part of, you know, that's part of the fanatics, uh, you know, personality. But uh, so those kind of bits and Murph, isn't it unbelievable? Like you, you were saying you're 14 years old and you remember that, you know, it's crazy. I remember the first time I encountered the fanatic and, and I know exactly where I was. I was behind the third base between the 200 level and the 300 level. There was that little walkway there. And we, he came out of one of the, you know, the vomitoriums there and, and 
and there he is. And he laid a big smooch on my face. And I remember I went to spit it out first, you know, because I knew he was going to spit it out. I like, you know, I got him, but uh, you know, it's just, I guess that's the magic of, of the fanatic, you know, you, you can, you know, have these make a memory that lasts forever. And, and it's just, uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I wonder as you um, spend time with the fanatic each and every night, if uh, if it ever for you feels like, oh, you know what, I, I, I've done this before because I can tell you from a fan standpoint and from someone who's been watching him for three decades, it never gets old for the fans. Does it does does it ever get old for you as you as you observe the the fanatic? Yeah, no, it, it doesn't. And it's so cool to hear guys like you, you know, uh, guys who've been in the business for so long, you know, sometimes the crotchetiest of, of, you know, writers, you know, some of the sports writers have come in town, these guys have been around forever. And, and when I hear them say that, that, you know, the fanatic still makes that makes them laugh and, uh, you know, uh, never gets old. And I think for me, it doesn't, uh, I don't know, subconsciously, I mean, it's kind of the entertainment business. I always think of, you know, rock stars, Bruce, and, you know, they, they put it out there every night and you, you you know when you go to a you know in the audience there's somebody who's never been to a phillies game before and so you know just i i don't think of that uh you know it's not i think just subconsciously it's like hey the fanatic's got to be on every night and you know that's what he does and that's his personality so it's no big deal but it is kind of cool to think that there might be somebody who's seeing the fanatic for the first time or maybe getting that first high five or smooch or whatever so it's cool yeah and you know we'll sit up in the in the booth and watch uh, him do his thing and and know exactly what's about to happen <laughs> turn to one another they he's gonna do this he does it and then we crack up <laughs> because yeah. it's hysterical <laughs> um, yeah it's so much fun all right well let's go back uh to 1993 and uh at that point um you become best friends with the fanatic and 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 that's the moment where uh, uh you're spending the most time with him and and starting you know as you said bringing a lot of what was already there forward, but also putting your own stamp on it. And I would, I would imagine those early days in 1993, think about the, the season itself and, and everything that was happening, the group of guys that you're dealing with out down there on the field. Um, what was the overriding emotions for you um, as you kind of embarked on that, not even knowing that you'd be sitting here in 2022, still talking about it. It was really an exciting time, Murph. I mean, uh, first of all, the Phillies go to the World Series. Uh, the Bill Giles, you know, packs a charter plane with all the front office employees. We go up to Toronto, just the time of our lives, come back. Uh, I get married in November. Can't forget that when I get married in November, <laughs> go to Hawaii for, you know, two weeks, come back. It's now it's first week in December. And that's when Dave Raymond tells me, Hey, I'm moving on. He was starting his own business. And uh, that's when I know I got, so those three months Murph were, were pretty awesome. And then, uh, yeah, the lead in was interesting too. I remember the daily news, you know, uh, doing a whole thing, like, you know, people who are going to be on the spot, you know, in 1994 and, the, and, you know, the, I was right in there, you know, <laughs> like, can the, can the new kid, you you know, uh, what can he do? So there, there was some of that pressure, but I felt really uh, comfortable. You know, I'd been doing it for five years. Uh, I've been watching Dave. I was working up in Fanavision for three years, uh, working on, you know, the routines and the music played at the ballpark. Uh, so I had a pretty good feel for it. So that opening day, 1994, you know, that was the one member, uh, uh, Crocker uh, had had his uh, yeah. cancer. Right. And, uh, you know, that was a lot of electricity uh, in, at the vet uh, that opening day my family of course i think i had 50 of my uh you know family and friends uh sitting in a section so uh, it was really an exciting time yeah. and and you were off and running and uh and haven't stopped since and literally running at some points and, and doing doing your thing there are so many great glove stories as we like to say here on the podcast that are connected with the fanatic and i, and I want you to tell a couple because you're, you're a terrific storyteller first and foremost and uh and and a lot of folks haven't heard these stories we're lucky enough to be around and, and hear some of these stories from time to time but uh, you mentioned bruce springsteen right you mentioned <laughs> rock stars and i know you've had your interactions with uh with a, a handful of different um we'll stick with music first it, it, i I know there was a special moment and I was there actually close to the front row in the Jimmy Buffett concert uh, a couple of years that well more than a couple of years back at this point but uh, tell that story about the about Jimmy Buffett because um that was a pretty special moment for you was it not it was you know and 
and the in finale. Citizens Bank Park and Citizens Bank Park history too. He was the first concert. Yes. Uh, you know, we opened the ballpark in two thousand. Uh, four right 2004 and then uh, so it was the next year was the first concert and uh they had asked so jimmy's crew had asked if the fanatic had joined jimmy buffett and i'm a big buffett fan so i was thrilled uh i remember uh actually audition not auditioning uh doing a rehearsal at about four o'clock in the afternoon i brought video dan with me it's like oh yeah he's my uh, you know he's my assistant he has to be up here meeting jimmy buffett but uh and jimmy couldn't have been nicer but the only thing i was supposed to do was uh, you know, the fanatic was supposed to do was to uh, during cheeseburger in paradise, they had had a picture of a bun, uh, lettuce, onion, you know, in that part of the song when he right. rattles off the menu items and or whatever makes up a cheeseburger. And we were just supposed to run across the stage with with these signs. And uh, so it was cool. The fanatic runs across. He's got some of his dancers, a couple of the crew running across stage. Well, the cra- place goes crazy. And uh, I don't know if Jimmy really understood the, you know, the love of the fanatic, Mer- yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, cheeseburger in paradise, we run across stage. Well, the, the, the stage manager is like, go back out there, go back out there. And so he does fins and he has the fanatic to lead fins to the left, fins to the right. Murph, I mean, listen, it's great to do a, a Phillies game, 45,000 people, 40,000 people at a rock concert. Everybody doing fins is pretty cool, too. You know? Yeah, and your perspective looking out, you know, I've been yeah. in, I'm in the crowd doing my fins, right? And, and, and that's pretty cool, too. But I can't imagine what that perspective was looking out and seeing that yeah, it was cool and then i come off the stage crowd still going crazy they send me back out there and it's a he does a cover of van morrison's brown eyed girl yeah. and so so the fanatic spent three was out there for three songs and i came off stage and they're like you got to come back tomorrow night so <laughs> i did this we did the same exact thing you know the next night and Buffett couldn't have been cooler like the last song it was glory days and i'm standing I, i'm now i watched the whole concert from you know backstage he come it's so rocks he comes off he has somebody like take the headsets off him he's barefoot he get he slips into his flip-flops and uh, i said thanks you know jimmy thanks man this is the greatest day of my life and uh you know he couldn't have been nicer yeah it was great well that's great to hear too because i'm a huge fan <laughs> of his uh and 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 there's so many more i mean we're, we're talking about the biggest stars in uh, on the planet right that you've had a right. chance to kind of uh, the fanatic has had a chance to be up on stage with yeah, you know when it start. It actually started uh, the vet. It was the first time Elton John and Billy Joel played together, wow. and I didn't think of. You know, I'm in a box and I'm watching the show, and somebody who's with me is like, "You should put." Well, you should have the fanatic, you know, go down there and just show up. And it hadn't crossed my mind. I can't believe it. I, I, I felt like, you know, I, I should have thought of that first, you know, <laughs> yeah. but uh, the bug was in my ear. I'm like, you know, let's get the fanatic in there. So I remember going down. Had the fanatic front row. Billy Joel is singing "The Bitches Back." It was it was the point of this, the the concert when they were singing each other's songs. Okay. And Billy Joel looks down. He gets up from his piano. He grabs the microphone and he's got the microphone in the fanatic snout and he's singing into the snout. You know. So great. So, uh, so from that point on, every time I go to a concert, it's like, hey, you know, maybe we could have the fanatic jump on stage. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, and then- but it does, but Murph, you did mention Bruce. That's when it, it didn't quite yes. work out. Yeah, well, yeah. Tell me, can you tell me a little bit about that? <laughs> <laughs> Bruce had done a, a concert a series at the um, at the Wells Fargo Center, but one of the games got, uh, or one of the games, one of the concerts got canceled uh, because of weather. So he came back and did a one night only at the Spectrum in 1999 in September. And uh, the Fanatic does his fifth inning routine. The Phillies are playing across the street at the Vet. And uh, the Fanatic, after his fifth inning routine, is on his ATV. He goes right up the truck ramp and right across the street to the Spectrum. <laughs> Uninvited? Uninvited. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, of course, the security guards are, are there and, you know, at the gates there. And they're like, hey, it's the Fanatic. Come on in, Fanatic. Like, there was no issue there. I, you know, the Fanatic got into the Spectrum like that. And literally within a minute, Fanatic had gone down the steps over a couple speakers and was in the first row. And Fanatic's a big Bruce fan, Murph, you know, and and unfortunately, unfortunately, the song he was playing was Murder Incorporated, okay, which is yep. like a really heavy, heavy. deep yep. Bruce is in his own mind kind of, you know, <laughs> and he wasn't happy. He turned around. And from what we heard, gathered, we heard the next day, he was yelling at people to get him out of there. You know, he wanted the fanatic out. So uh, somebody from the spectrum came down and kind of escorted the fanatic out. Of course, the fanatic high five and everybody, you know, on the way out of the concert. 
<laughs> oh my god! So, but I, yeah. to this to this day, I always thought if he was playing Glory Days or one of these upbeat things, he probably would have brought the fanatic right up, you know, like Courtney Cox, you know. But yep, uh, yep. not yep. to be, not, not to, be. to be. You are not <laughs> Courtney Cox. <laughs> the fanatic is not <laughs> Courtney Cox. Uh, that's hysterical. That that really is. Um, it, I would imagine uh, getting a chance to to hang out with the fanatic uh, like you do. Some of the experiences that you've had. Um, I know you've traveled the, the world with him. Um, Australia, am I right when I say Australia, Japan? You've been yes. to Japan? Yeah, a number of times in Japan. Yeah. 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 I, tell, tell me a little bit about, uh, about the, those trips because, again, internationally now, the Fanatic yeah. is recognizable to so many people. Yeah, and one of the ways that came about was uh, back uh, after I had just kind of taken over from Dave, uh, Major League Baseball got very active with their international um, offices, and they have some offices all over the world, and they wanted to kind of have a, a fan fest type experience in some of these different countries, and uh, they would bring the Fanatic along, which was great. I got a chance to travel to a lot of places, uh, really, really neat, and then uh, you had that Japan uh, Major League Baseball All-Star Series that happens every other year. That is always weird to me, Murph, that more people don't know about that. Uh, you know, here in the States, it's been happening since the 50s. You know, players like Mickey Mantle and Hank Garen, you know, used to go there every other year. Uh, so it's a really big deal in Japan. And Major League Baseball always brings their A-list uh, stars. And uh, so I got a chance to go on a few of those, uh, which is great. You know, just hanging out with the the big leaguers, they really roll out the red carpet for those guys when we're over there. Uh, but it does amaze me, you know, uh, you know, that the, the people do really recognize the fanatic, especially in Japan. They're, they're such baseball fans. My only regret was I wanted to bring the hot dog launcher and fill it with sushi. And uh, <laughs> it never it was my one regret, Murph. I wanted to shoot raw fish at the Tokyo Dome. Oh, who it never would, came right? to <laughs> But. <laughs> I, I do remember that first time in the Tokyo Dome, you know, and, and I had an, an interpreter uh, and my brother was with me, which was great. We had a ball in Japan. And uh, but uh, going into the crowd was very, very unusual. They, they're they're it's, it's weird. You've seen Japanese baseball. The outfield is they've got the bands playing and the people are making noise. The infield area, it's all very staid and very calm. And here comes the fanatic into the crowd, which their mascots don't do. They have mascots. They stay on the field. After a home run, the mascot runs out and kind of high fives the player and they throw a, a, a doll into the crowd. That's what they do. They don't go into the crowd. And I remember with the fanatic and uh they had security come and take the fanatic uh out <laughs> and so we had, of course we had to have a meeting and the interpreter no this is what the fanatic does you know um so yeah it, it was neat and the one highlight to murph uh, one of those all-star series the fanatic got a, a chance a chance to dance with uh sarahara O. Oh. Oh, uh, he was he was the first yeah. base coach. And okay. again, they had never seen this one before in that the Fanatic put on a dress and made a <laughs> beeline for, uh, you know, the greatest home run hitter in, you know, Japan just, history. He was he was the first uh, base coach and uh, I had cleared it ahead of time. But uh, I forget what song, you know, and he gave a little bit of a danced a little bit and the crowd loved it. You know, they loved it. So. I, I, it's so great. I can picture that. And you know what? I, on a side note, I, I think it's probably important to mention that no matter where you go in the world, Australia, Japan, the other I know you've been down to Mexico and Puerto Rico. Everywhere you go, I'm sure kids are wide eyed and laughing. And 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 it just goes to show you that, you know, we're all very similar we're all the, all around this globe. Right. And that that it's something someone like the Philly fanatic uh, kind of points that out that, uh, you know, we all share that that uh, love and need to, to laugh and, and, and be entertained. Right. And he's able yeah. to do that. Yeah, no question. I mean, uh, th th that's what we have all in common and yeah. uh, it it's neat because, you know, some of these places are more familiar with the fanatic. Uh, some of these countries that are, you know, you mentioned Mexico, that's, you know, the fanatic sure. has been, it's done the Mexican winter league down there, like in central Mexico. And uh, you know, that, it, 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 you know, nobody speaks English and the, the ballparks are small. And I, I always think of the Blues Brothers movie when there was chicken, when the, the Blues I, Brothers went to play on at that on that stage. Like, why is there chicken yeah. wire? It's like, well, because they're throwing stuff. And <laughs> exactly. there's chicken wire in front of the dugout and the one ballpark we went to. And like, if they don't like the act, you know, you're going to get you're going to see it. But uh, 
uh, you know, but places like that, they all laugh at the same thing at the same time. They love, you know, if Fnatic gets the umpire involved or whatever. Uh, it's it's pretty neat. Bald heads need polishing all over the world. Exactly. There, there, exactly. You know, we, we know that. <laughs> um, it, it's 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 so cool for me to think about, um, you know, all the stuff that you've been able to do. Uh, but but back here in Philadelphia um, on a nightly basis, you know, and you're, you're bringing it every night. It's it, it's not always perfect. I mean, there have been moments where you where the fanatic has been in situations that well, put them in, in a little bit of peril, right? I mean, are there, are there moments where you thought to yourself, oh my goodness, the, the fanatics might be in trouble here? <laughs> well, let's see. In terms of doing some like stunts, like, yeah. you know, uh, in, in terms of being in trouble and getting hurt, uh, there have been some things we've done. I guess the, the, the craziest thing the fanatics done since I've been his friend is to rappel down from the top of the vet down to the dugout. Right. He's, he did it three times. And uh, yeah, it, it was a little, and we told the fanatic, fanatic, okay, hold on. First of all, you're going to be clocking about 35 miles an hour going down the, the wire, but also lift your legs because if you don't lift your legs you're gonna twirl well at the one time he didn't lift his legs and he came down you know doing one of these and it was it was very death defying but uh the fanatic uh well he he was a little he was a little freaked out by that one that might have been the last time he did it yeah <laughs> the, the fanatic and his best friend might have said that's that's enough of that repelling for the, but that was at the vet is that what that was at the vet yeah yeah I think about how high that was <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah my my brothers were up there actually the first time i did it my brothers came up because they knew what was and so uh they were like good luck tom and as we pushed and it wasn't me of course it was the fanatic who we you know sent sailing but uh yeah no so all right. Now, your buddy, John Brazier, told me another story about uh, now often the fanatic will catch the first pitch um, and uh, go down on the field and get his picture taken with the folks that are throwing them out. And uh, from time to time, things don't always go the way you plan. Uh, can you tell the story about the young girl that uh, was a little reluctant to throw? At first? Murph, it was it was like one of the first games that I worked. OK, so it was uh, we had opening day in 1994. This might have been like the next night game. Wow. And uh, they and it was just funny because ah, now they, they used to throw the ball out from the mayor's box, which was right next to the dug at Philly's dugout. And uh, they actually had to bring a, a band member, this little girl. She's probably about 12 years old over to uh, the mayor's box. She has her you know, marching outfit on. And uh, I think she was a clarinet player. And right. uh, anyway, she throws the ball out and I'm, ah, this is, here we go. And uh, I took one right in the eye. Yeah, took it, took it right in the eye. <laughs> and, and, and when when the fanatic takes one in the eye, I mean, he gets affected. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he's only yeah. coming, it, right? <laughs> it staggered me a little bit. And uh, I just felt like such a loser, you know, just like, you know, all I got to do is catch this, you know, this, and I'm fired up, you know, it's one of the first times. But when we talk about injuries, Murph, and I, and I, don't, I don't know if I told you this one, uh, and maybe the fans know it, but, you know, he, the Fanatic got hit in Lehigh Valley. Oh, I remember. And, yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, he's, he's three rows behind the, the dugout and a, a foul ball hits the dugout and hits the Fanatic right in the neck which amazingly somehow I wind up with the shiner you know you know that's how close we are Murph yes but I know I'll never forget uh you know the fanatic comes staggering everybody's laughing because they think it's part of the act <laughs> and you know and so I get out to the aisle where the woman the fanatic goes out to the aisle and the woman who's supposed to be taking care of the fanatic uh, you know, learns that the fanatic is hurt and they got to get him out of there. And so she, she goes on a walkie talkie and she calls the EMT. Well, we go up the steps and the fanatic, of course, there's 50 people sure. waiting for on the concourse, waiting for pictures. Meanwhile, the fanatic is staggering, you know, he's not feeling great. Here come the EMT. It's like, Oh, finally, you know, I'm, you know, we're going to get some help here. And the EMT guys pull out their cell phones and they want pictures with the fanatic. You know, <laughs> It's like, no, no, he needs to go to a hospital. You know, yeah. He doesn't care about your job. All right. Yeah, My yeah. job's over tonight. <laughs> yeah, I, so, I remember that. I remember when that happened. Uh, when they put the nets up, uh, that yeah. was one of the things I thought about. I'm like, all right, all right. The fanatic is safe now. The fanatic is safe. On the duck out. That's a good <laughs> um, all right. Let me throw out a couple of names and uh, tell me what you think about when you hear these names. Because, again, um, in doing my research, your buddy uh, helped me out. Uh, Bruce Bochy. 
crucified. You have been talking to Brady, but it's his favorite thing. It's <laughs> oh, his I love favorite thing. Too, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Dave Raymond, God bless him. You know, he did so many different things that were kind of revolutionary. You know, the four wheeler, you know, the, uh, the interacting with players, you know, that part of the game, you know, but before the game starts, it's, it's kind of neat for the fanatic. Cause I think if you, you can win the crowd over in that, in that first 20 minutes, you know, and you can, and you're, you're goofing with these players who aren't used to being goofed with, you know, it's just something different and um, it's great. Uh, and so he, he really started that. And so, you know, the fanatic, you know, it's continued to do that. And part of it is to kind of go through the lineups. And if you remember Murph, you know, like, Back in the day, our guys really had uh, stances that were very um, unique to them. So, you know, Schmidt, had the butt wiggle. You had Pete Rose in the crouch. You had, you know, Gary Maddox with, you know, the long stride stretch. Uh, you had the bull just standing there. So um, players today, they don't, they're, their uh, stances aren't very unique. I think they're all taught now to do it a certain way, you know? Yeah. And uh, so the Fanatic has had to improvise a little bit with certain players and like just try to pick on some of either their name or whatever. But Bruce Bochy, you know, the, the manager of the Giants, I mean, he's got a huge head, big melon. Right. Like every, and and everyone knows that. Yeah. Everybody knows that. And he knows that. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, so the Fanatic would just do a, a whole mime thing, you know, where he pretends like pick up this big, huge like boulder, you know, it's invisible. And he's like carrying it. And then he, puts it on his head and then he's, he can't keep straight. He's, he's balancing, trying to stay balanced and he'd go down on his head and then he'd try to lift his head up and it's, it's, it's being weighed down and he would do the whole thing. And the players would ask for it every game, you know, do the Bochi thing, do the Bochi thing. And Bochi would always be standing there right at the steps, you know, <laughs> kind of smiling you know yeah. and uh good easy and... good one so <laughs> but not, not everybody loves what the fanatic does right no. i mean no. you've, had, you've had your run-ins as well i mean run-ins yeah famously um and, yeah. and i'm right when i say um the tommy lasorda run-in was before uh you became his best friend but you've had yeah. your own share of run-ins with those guys right absolutely and with lasorda you know and little known fact here and dave raymond told me this i did not know he went to japan once and this is where he says it all started there was a box of baseballs uh in the clubhouse that all the all-stars were supposed to sign and they asked for the fanatic to sign the balls as well and so he signed it on the sweet spot and apparently that's that's where the manager is supposed to yeah. sign and tommy lasorda was the manager at the time of that all-star uh, team in japan so that's what dave says that's when it started like you know and then of course dave just and the fanatic continued with the smashing of the helmets and the, the, the sort of dummy. Yes. And, um, you know, I couldn't, that was one of the things when I took over for Dave that I couldn't wait to like, you know, pick up where Dave left off in terms of the feud. And uh, I'll never forget that first game there in town, Tony, the old Italian um, uh, security guard. Uh, of course, him and Tommy were like this. Yeah. And as the fanatic comes out, Tony has Lasorda out on the field and Tony is going to make the peace. He's, he's going to try to broker a little peace deal. Like, Hey, it's a new fanatic. Let bygones be bygones. I didn't come close to it. I'm like, I don't want any parts of this because I have a fifth inning routine that was going to totally tick Tommy <laughs> off. And I didn't want any peace. This is, this oh is God. great, you know, material, you know, <laughs> so, great. so we had, a, we had a guy in fan division. We put him in the sort of Jersey and we put pillows, you know, we, bulked him up, put pillows in his butt and white hair. And he comes waddling out. And I did, the fanatic did some kind of, uh, you know, I forget how we abused him, but Lasorda from just, you know, throwing baseballs and every curse word in the book, you know, just not a fan. No, he, <laughs> and he never was. Right? Never was. Never no. was. And then, no. you know what? Shame on him because exactly. <laughs> he should have found some humor in all yeah. of that. Um, what about uh, Phillies players? The, the, who are the who are give me one or two of the best guys that really um, you know kind of played into the shtick with with the fanatic? Yeah, and it's funny, Murph, because I generally will um, engage, or the fanatic will also engage the the visiting team. Uh, you know, try to knock them off their game yeah. a little bit. Um, you know, maybe let the Phillies um, prepare for the game. So if you notice the fanatics, not always going after Phillies folks, but the, the ones who do are usually the bullpen guys, you know, the guys who are just looking for something to do, you know, and I always think of uh, Wayne Gomes, Wayne Gomes was a great Gomes. guy and he, yeah. yeah, Gomes, he would always, uh, you know, be up for dancing or, uh, you know, having fun. 
so he, he's one guy that sticks out. And of course, Shane was always kind of loose with the fanatic too. He was always great. Um, but again, you know, a lot of times it was, you know, let them kind of get ready for the game and, uh, you know, and the fanatic the go, yeah. go, go bug the visiting players. <laughs> I've, I've always felt like when a visiting player engages with the fanatic and has some fun, steals your key, steals the keys, yeah. um, you know, or does whatever. And, and it, that, that, humanizes him to the point where Phillies fans are like, you know what? That guy's all right. I, I, I like that guy. Yeah, would you agree for with sure. That? For they, sure. They, they would think like that. I mean, from a marketing standpoint, it yeah, yeah. can help, help them in the long run, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, if, no question. And there definitely have been players like that. You know, we were just talking about Tom Lasorda. Well, is it his godson, Mike Piazza, uh, yeah. was always great with the Fanatic. And his routine would be uh, usually once a – a homestand when they'd come in, the Mets would come in. Uh, the Fanatic has the ATV parked out there and we'd just go like this and Piazza would come out and we would always do a uh, an arm wrestling bit. And of course the Fanatic would always get like flipped over. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so yeah, he was one guy who always got it. Um, yeah, and, and it does humanize him, Murph. And, and it's, uh, it's cool for the, the fans to see the players having fun with the Fanatic. Um, and, and I guess... You know, the, the number one guy now is uh, Bryce Harper, you yeah. know, um, you know, Harp, you know, he uh, always loved the Fanatic when he was with Washington, would always be watching the Fanatic, uh, you know, enjoyed the Fanatic. I remember seeing him during the All-Star game. He made a point to come over to the Fanatic and, you know, you're, you're great. Like he would always do that. It's like, wow, Harper's cool. You know, the Fanatic always thought Harper was cool. And then when he got, you know, signed with the Phillies, uh, we were down in Clearwater and they wanted to have the fanatic part of, they didn't know this love affair existed already, but they wanted to have the fanatic, you know, we, we had that press conference on the dugout, the, the roof of the dugout. And so we were being held in um, uh, the locker room, the visiting locker room in Clearwater. Uh, uh, Harp had his mom and dad and his wife and uh, his agent, Scott Boris, and some other people was kind of like a holding area. Well, the fanatic comes into the room and uh, comes barreling in and he he not he goes to he sees Harper's wife and he goes to knock Harper over. He he stumbles over a stool like this is just before the press conference because the fanatic wants to give the big smooch to his wife. And uh, but he, and I was I, like. I can't believe the fanatic just did that, but he laughed and, you know, it was like, Oh, whew, okay. Thankfully. <laughs> yeah, thank <you> know? God, <laughs> but then, but then his dad, Harper's dad's like, Hey, you know, Bryce, show him your uh, bat, show him your bat. And he's like, yeah, fanatic, check it out. And he, he shows me a picture of this beautiful art decorated bat that has the fanatic all over it. And I'm like, wow. Okay. And then from there on in, it was socks and shoes and, you know, total yeah. fanatic fan, you know? Yeah. And, and he is, I mean, he is, yeah. it, you know, we we're lucky enough to, to know Bryce a little bit and it's not an act. I mean, he, he no. genuinely enjoys it. I mean, seriously, like 98% of the people on this planet genuinely enjoy the fanatic. So it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't make him special, but he gets it. And, and I yeah. think, yeah. I think that's kind of cool. Um, all right. We're running out of time. I don't want to keep you too much longer. Uh, but let me ask you this, because one of the things that I marvel at is uh, the physicality of of the Philly fanatic. I mean, he doesn't look like an athlete, but man, oh, man, some of the stuff that he does on a nightly basis, um, you know, it's, it's a mix between, the, you know, parkour and and gymnastics and you know I, I watched him walk on the back of the seats and I'm, I'm always like oh my god he's gonna fall the, the amount of energy and the on an august afternoon that the fanatic expends out there on the field is is enormous um how how does he do it i mean how are how are you able to help him do that <laughs> well you got to have a screw loose bar that's number one uh it's 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 a little bit of a mirage too it's almost like people you know you know the fact dances you know and it's like i always love it like you know sometimes i'll go to a wedding and sometimes i can kind of feel eyes on me a little bit like i know people are like oh oh yeah that's you know who that is okay and like when i go on the dance floor i think people are expecting like danny terrio or something you know like they're expecting and i and then they look and like oh like that that can't be the fanatic like you know, oh, you know. so uh, i think that the costume hides a lot of, of sure. flaws when it comes to that and then yeah the physicality of it too um you know, uh, and the energy, I think it's important to uh, the fanatic takes breaks through the game. Like you can't really keep that up 
for nine innings, you know, right. so it's, um, and the Fnatic has visits to make and it's just, uh, it's all kind of timed out to some degree, but the key is that, you know, if, if you've taken a break and you can get back out there and, uh, you, you, you can lay it all out there and, and have that energy, you know, uh, that, that's a big part of it. And yeah, the rest is just stupidity, Murph. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps some, but, uh, but, but it sure is fun to watch. Um, it's always fun to watch people doing stupid things, right? Uh, before, before I let you go, I, I I'll mention this just because you brought up the dancing. Um, and you and I have talked about this before. But uh, back in 1993, when you were becoming the best friend of the Fanatic, they were looking for a, uh, a you know, a, another friend of the Fanatic to fill that second role that you had filled. And, uh, and, and there was this young aspiring fanatic uh friend right here that tried out and and you talk did. about the dancing yeah you can dance because the 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 tryout they brought us into the eagles visiting locker room and That's they right. called my name i'm 23 years old just out of st joe's and and there's a table of of panelists with a boom box in the middle of the table and they yeah. pressed the button and said dance and i started you know like like <laughs> Wayne bennis i guess or whatever and uh <laughs> And well, you know, those dreams were, were crushed just like that. So you must have <laughs> once, once we saw your dance moves, Murph, you were, uh, you were eliminated. You know, I made it through the first couple of interviews, but then after the dance moves, it took yeah. me, you know, it took me 20 years to get back to the organization. So, uh, <laughs> but I think it was for the best. <laughs> that can be the one that separates, uh, yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 the gang, you know, that dancing, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. I, I think that's, uh, that's where we <laughs> definitely parted ways with me for sure. Um, it's so great. All right. Final note, just uh, the impact that the Philly Fanatic has. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about it right at the top, but uh, you have to be incredibly proud of the way that uh, it has all unfolded. Um, he is he is such a part of baseball. He is such a part of the city of Philadelphia. I know he's a, such a part of you uh, as well. Uh, the the pride that that you have when you see the green everywhere you go. Can you, can you describe that to us? Yeah, it's, uh, it's hard to describe Murph. And I don't think anybody would have pictured, uh, you know, when Bill Giles kind of thought of this and, and led the search to have the fanatic, you know, come to Philadelphia. Uh, I don't think anybody anticipated it would have the popularity and the longevity and the love, uh, you know, and so I'm very proud and I, I love seeing the fanatic, you know, the headbands and the hats and people wearing their fanatic gear. It's unbelievable. And then it's also uh, just such a great way uh, to bring new fans into the game and to make them Philly fans. And I have one story and I've told it before, but it, it really, uh, I always get goosebumps when I, I think about it. It was the last game at the vet, uh, it, not the last game, I'm sorry, it was the last uh, year at the vet and it was the uh, Fanatic birthday party and Kevin Millwood threw a no hitter. And I'll never forget uh, coming back from the game, listening to sports radio and everybody was calling because they were just at the game and to, they were all saying, hey, we were at the game because it was the Philly Fanatic's birthday we go every year and now my kid got to see history made and it's like wow that, well there you go and uh you know it could be the books we just um you know had our fanatic about reading uh last you know the other day and uh, a kid can be introduced to Phillies baseball through you know one of the kids books or maybe he's it takes a doll to bed at night and you know he's <laughs> you know it, yeah yeah it could be that and so to, uh, to know that the fanatic plays a role in bringing you know uh cultivating sports fans and Phillies fans and baseball fans really uh, is very satisfying. Yeah, I, you know what? That is such an important part of it. Uh, the, the joy he brings each night is is you know is there, and 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 we all enjoy that. But but the long term effect, um, which I guess we can't really measure, but the long term effect is certainly there. My kids grew up with the fanatic. I grew up with the fanatic, um, and and there there's that's real. It's tangible. Um, I wonder if it would have been this way in any other city in america I, hmm. I i've i've often wondered that i mean mascots come and go um mm -hmm. there have been some good ones there have been some bad ones but but nobody resonates like the philly fanatic and i think part of that is because he's ours and when, mm -hmm. when we have someone that's ours yeah, yeah this city celebrates it like nobody else right yeah, for sure. For sure. It was a great mix. And it could have, you're right, it could have gone, I think, the other way if Dave Raymond wasn't who he was yeah. or the, the yeah. costume didn't look the way it was. And uh, so it could have maybe gone the other way. But yeah, once the, the Philly fans grabbed hold and made it there, very well said, Murph. It's true. It's uh, we, he's the fanatics locked in now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, Bill Giles, Dave Raymond, Tom Burgoyne, um, you know, what, what they have been able to bring to us uh, over the last, well, I don't even know, what is it, 35, 40 years? Yes, 44 years. 44 years. Yeah. Uh, just completely, it's just remarkable. Tom, thank you so much. Uh, I, I knew this would be fun. Uh, we could do this probably for another hour, but I won't. Make yeah, it. we could. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but thank you. I appreciate your time. And uh, I look forward to seeing you when we get, uh, when we get back in town. Yeah, safe travels, Murph. See you back to ballpark. All right, Tom Burgoyne joining us here on Glove Stories with Murph. Let's take a quick break, but up next, Charlie Manuel, Larry Boa join us here on the program. The all-new Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app is here for both Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Get in on all the action, whether it's baseball, the basketball and hockey playoffs, golf, all your favorite sports. Download the all-new Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app and make your first bet risk-free up to $750. Bet more than the score. Bet on individual player performances for hits, home runs, and strikeouts. Bet innings, first team to score, and more. Bet Parks is the only sportsbook and casino app that I recommend. The Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app, where odds, bets, slots, and games all come together in perfect harmony right in your pocket. Sportsbook and all your favorite casino games for real money, all in one amazing app. Live in-game betting lets you bet while you watch the game. Download right now in the App Store, Google Play Store, or at BetParks.com and use my promo code MURPH. Bet Parks is also an official proud betting operator of the PGA Tour. The all new Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app. You must be 21 and in Pennsylvania or New Jersey. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler. Welcome to This Week in Philly Baseball History, presented by Shad Vintage Sports. This week in 1989, a 10 run Philadelphia comeback led Pittsburgh broadcaster Jim Rooker to embark on a 320 mile journey from the city of brotherly love to the Steel City. Vaughn Hayes and Steve Jeltz hit two home runs in a 15-11 victory at the Vet. Celebrate Philly sports history with a unique Father's Day gift from Scheib Vintage Sports. Visit them at 13th and Walnut Streets or ScheibSports.com. Phillies Nation is your source for breaking news, original analysis, trade insights, and more. Read today's articles at philliesnation.com. And welcome back to Glove Stories, brought to you by the Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app, Shy Vintage Sports, and Phillies Nation. And it is the time on the program where we welcome in our Phillies Wall of Famers. Larry Boa, Charlie Manuel are here. And this is going to be a fun topic, guys, because we're talking about, well, those guys that are on the other team that, well, you just can't stand, right? Fans always have a guy on the other squad that they don't like but in a heartbeat would take them on their team because they are winners. They're good players. They're great players. Uh, they could be uh, a- a- annoying Nat kind of players or just the kind of guy that just uh, tears your heart out every single night. So uh, guys that uh, you played against that at the time, Larry, you didn't really like, but, but man, you would have loved them as a teammate. Well, the one guy I hated him as it, not what well, I don't mean literally, but yeah, when, I know. When, when I saw that uniform, Pete Rose, <laughs> he would do everything in his power to beat you. He could beat you with his glove. He could beat you with running the bases the right way, obviously swinging the bat. And eventually, the guy that we didn't like, he became a Philly. And when you're looking across the dugout and you see him, you say, oh, God, he's coming up in the eighth inning. You know, this is the guy you don't want to see hit. But then to have him on our side, and th- that, those were the same ideas and everything that other teams, when he came became a Philly, they used to say, we used to hate Pete Rose. And... <laughs> Everybody, guys, it seems like Murph that knew how to win, that would do anything at all to beat you. Those are the guys you really respect, but obviously you'd like them on your team. We were lucky to get Pete at the end, which put us over the hump. But I had to watch him in Cincinnati for a long time (laughs) and he tore our hearts out. Believe me. Yeah, I know. I, you know, you, you think back to that time period and as a fan, uh, you know, that big red machine, it was like, they, they, they couldn't do anything wrong. And Pete was the catalyst to all of that. So unbelievable stand in, in Philadelphia, Charlie, what about you uh, in terms of uh, uh, guys that, uh, that across the aisle, you just you couldn't, you didn't want to see them, but you love to see them in your uniform. You know, I got, I used to see guys, uh, what basically I, what you're saying is I, I relate to the fact that you see guys, it's not like I that, that I actually hated them or something, but I didn't want to see them come up and things like that. And so, therefore, I hated to see them come up the plate. And that was Barry Bonds, uh, Ken Griffith Jr., <laughs> guys like this. 
And there's guys that who used to get real mad when they played and you'd say, gee, many Christmas was, you know, like, look at that guy's attitude or something. Paul, Paul O'Neill was kind of a, always kind of a, a you know, like a high strung player, you know, he showed emotions. Even Ted Williams showed, uh, you know, like he, I think in Boston, that's why the press always talked about Ted Williams being so brass and so loud and stuff, you know, like, uh, and, uh, uh, those kind of players, you know, like you, you, you kind of, although you might not like their attitude or something like that, or, or how they come across, you still, you still like them because, and you, and you admire them and you have respect for them for who they are. And yeah. when I see, when I see, uh, you know, like somebody that's like had trouble in the game or something like that. And, uh, and, and, uh, but yet he still, becomes a very famous player you know like that's who the guy is that's his attitude and uh, i've seen guys that i didn't like but at the same time you know like uh uh when when i got around him i liked him jason worth was one of them you know that? <laughs> yeah that's a good that's, one you know yeah i can totally see that <laughs> <laughs> jason worth hey look when he played for the dodgers murph i can remember this just like you know like my first year managing the first scene first year i saw him and he didn't run balls out and stuff like that. And he was real kind of into himself and things like that. And I, made, I, I remember making a statement to uh, a, a Gary Varsho. I said, look, we could have that guy right there on our team. And, you know, like Pat Gillick went out and got him. <laughs> That's a true story. I'm you laid down the law pretty quick, I bet. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know what? I've always said this too. You know, like I, uh, he changed when he uh, when he he wanted to play with our team, and also he respected our players, and his attitude completely changed. If you ask him, he would probably tell you the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but let me ask you. So, a couple of the players we named, most of the players we named, Hall of Fame caliber players, guys that are in the Hall of Fame or, or should be in the Hall of Fame. Um, right. What about uh, maybe just that uh, that average guy that that always seemed. To, is there anyone you could think of in, in that? Yeah, there was, this this guy wasn't average, but he's not a Hall of Famer. Right, was Bill Madlock. I okay, mean, this guy he would come up with hits. He was a real good hitter, yeah. and it seemed like he would always be hitting, whether he was with the Cubs or with the Pirates. Always be hitting in crucial situations. Uh, you know, you expect the Stargills and the Clemenes and that to get big hits. Right. But Bill Madlock was a, was a grinder, man. And uh, you know, when he he was on the same team as Bill Buckner. You got two guys on the corners there, outstanding players. Neither one of them made the Hall of Fame. And I'm going to tell you right now, Buckner, there might be some argument there. He had a tremendous career. But Bill Madlock was a Philly killer, and I used to hate watching this guy come up. He, he would never give away at bats. He was a tough out. And, you know, those guys, when they got in the batter's box, and Charlie can probably attest to this more than I can, you knew when they got in the batter's box – Whoever was pitching, it was going to be a battle. I don't care how good your pitcher was that day. You had to do everything in your power to get these guys out, especially in crucial situations of the game, bases loaded or eighth inning, winning run on second, two outs. These guys always responded with big hits. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's exactly what we're talking about, Charlie. Uh, yeah, the kind of guy that get, he may end up striking out, but he gets he sees twelve pitches and he and he's wearing out your guy, right? Yeah, yeah. Starger was one of those guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Willie Stargell was one of those guys. McCovey was one of those guys. I mean, you know, like I, I, uh, I don't know if both, yeah, both probably saw McCovey more than I did. I but saw McCovey. Uh, yeah. uh, McCovey was definitely one of those guys. Yeah, yeah. another yeah. another great player. Another great without player. a doubt. Yeah. But and then uh, getting back to Paul O'Neill, he was one of those guys could hit too in the big time. You know, like he, you know, like he would, yeah. Uh, when he when he's up there, he was a tough out. Yeah. But that, it gets another back. Uh, most of that gets back the guy's earned the right because he's a, you know, he's a very consistent player. You know, he's consistent in his hitting you know, like, and, he, and he's, a, he, and he becomes a tough out because who he is and his makeup and, and, you know, like and how he grinds out. That's what a grinder is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know what, Charlie, you had one of the ultimate grinders uh, on your team, Chase Utley. Uh, well, you both know Chase really well. I mean, he was the guy, I mean, there was, there was a time in, in his prime where every year you'd see the poll of major league baseball players, the most disliked player, was Chase Utley, but again, there is there wasn't one team in the league that wouldn't have taken him uh, in their clubhouse because that's the kind of player he was. And you know, he happened to be here in Philadelphia. Lucky for us, but that's the exact kind of player he was, right, Charlie? He without a doubt. That's, that's exactly. You know, like he didn't he didn't talk much, and he he was uh, hard to get him to laugh. 
<laughs> but, at the, <laughs> but at the same time, I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I love the game. Put a lot of money in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, Murph, I think, you know, every, every team needs a player like that. Yeah. But if you're fortunate to have two of them, maybe three, yeah. it's unbelievable how it helps your clubhouse. Yeah. When you have everybody who have the same personality, and not to say they're not good guys, they're all good guys, good players, but you need two or three guys that have that edge. And I think on this year's team, just watching, you know, I'm not down there in the uniform or anything, but the Castellanos to me is that kind of guy. He Great. plays with an edge. And when you get a guy like that and he doesn't like to, to, to kibitz with other guys during the game, you see everything's all business in that. That's how you're supposed to play. And Ut, Ut did that as well as anybody. Uh, I, I like guys like that. And I think it brings something to your clubhouse. Obviously, the way people construct their 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 teams now, they think maybe those guys are troublemakers. They're not troublemakers, believe me. They sort of put everything together and they're glued to your ball club. Absolutely. But that that's when we back when we played or coached, you needed those guys in that locker room. Yeah, and they're yeah. few and far between nowadays. But uh, if yeah. you do find one, if you do find one, you've got yeah. a good thing for sure. Yeah. Uh, Charlie, Larry, great stuff as always. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. And we'll talk to you next week on Glove Stories, okay? All right, Murph. Thanks, Take Murph. care. Welcome to This Week in Philly Baseball History, presented by Shy Vintage Sports. This week in 1989, a 10-run Philadelphia comeback led Pittsburgh broadcaster Jim Rooker to embark on a 320-mile journey from the city of brotherly love to the Steel City. Vaughn Hayes and Steve Jeltz hit two home runs in a 15-11 victory at the Vet. Celebrate Philly sports history with a unique Father's Day gift from Shy Vintage Sports. Visit them at 13th and Walnut Streets or ShibeSports.com. The all-new Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app is here for both Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Get in on all the action, whether it's baseball, the basketball and hockey playoffs, golf, all your favorite sports. Download the all-new Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app and make your first bet risk-free up to $750. Bet more than the score. Bet on individual player performances for hits, home runs, and strikeouts. Bet innings, first team to score, and more. Bet Parks is the only sportsbook and casino app that I recommend. The Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app, where odds, bets, slots, and games all come together in perfect harmony right in your pocket. Sportsbook and all your favorite casino games for real money, all in one amazing app. Live in-game betting lets you bet while you watch the game. Download right now in the App Store, Google Play Store, or at BetParks.com and use my promo code MURPH. Bet Parks is also an official proud betting operator of the PGA Tour. The all new Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app. You must be 21 and in Pennsylvania or New Jersey. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler. Phillies Nation is your source for breaking news, original analysis, trade insights, and more. Read today's articles at philliesnation.com. Glove Stories with Murph is sponsored by the Bet Parks Casino and Sportsbook app, along with Shine Vintage Sports and Phillies Nation, and is a presentation of SBC Media Partners. The engineer for Glove Stories is Chad Evans. Cindy Webster is our marketing and guest relations director, and our executive producer is Roger Haddon. Whether you are watching us on YouTube or downloading the podcast from one of the major podcast providers like Apple, Google, or Spotify, make sure to hit like and subscribe.